pleasure to welcome you all here to our 16th uh, William Pitt seminar. Uh, a warm welcome both to our in-person audience and to those who are joining us uh, remotely, including especially one of our speakers, Lavania. Now, every year we try and focus the seminar on a, a topic of great importance and concern in the public realm. There is, I would argue, no greater topic of uh, concern in the public realm than this one that we are addressing uh, here this afternoon. Um, uh, climate change is a reality for all of us. It is becoming increasingly a reality and we uh, uh, need to do everything we possibly can uh, to address the problems that it raises. With the COP26 uh, ahead of us in just uh, uh, two or three weeks time, um, the topic that we are discussing here, which is what should the COP26 do, um, is an incredibly important and timely one. Um, this is the first William Pitt seminar we have ever done in this hybrid format. So please bear with us if uh, any of the technology produces any glitches. I'm sure it won't. This is Selwyn College after all. Uh, 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 now, uh, I will hand over to our chair for the afternoon, uh, 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 Mike Hume. Uh, Mike is a Pembroke Fellow. He is Professor of Human Geography in the University. Uh, his research is concerned with representations of climate change in history, culture, and media. And he is probably one of the most knowledgeable people in the country on the subject that we are uh, uh, discussing today. That is except for the other members of the panel. Uh, so Mike, thank you for uh, doing the chairing. Over to you. Thank, thank you very much, Master. Uh, that's always very, very embarrassing. Uh, and actually very dangerous because it sort of gives me a license, doesn't it, to... Uh, <laughs> say things uh, off, off the cuff. Anyway, uh, welcome uh, on my behalf to everybody and also to those of you who are watching online. Uh, just a word or two at the beginning about the Corporate Partnership Programme at Pembroke, if I might. Um, this is a unique programme amongst the Cambridge Colleges and it is now in its 25th anniversary year. Uh, originally intended as a mechanism for corporate donors to give to the college, it has now evolved and expanded uh, so that today we have 11 partners who are welcomed as members of our college community. So corporate fellows at Pembroke use the program to navigate and explore the university at large, seeking academic uh, partnerships and uh, conversations uh, to assist and aid and direct uh, some of the challenges that they face in their business world. And conversely, the program allows some of our students and fellows to uh, access and engage with the knowledge and insights that our corporate fellows have and can bring from the business world into our academic and learning environments. So both sides benefit from that partnership program. And earlier this year, our, all of our corporate partners were brought together in a virtual round table. Uh, and it was through that round table planning and discussion that the topic of this seminar emerged today uh, with the title, What Should Come From COP26. So uh, thank you to our corporate partners uh, for uh, enabling and provoking us to uh, lay on this seminar today. Now, I am gonna start off with one or two <laughs> remarks of my own um, before I introduce the four panelists, uh, and then we will move on climate change, in my view, is no longer an issue of incomplete or imprecise scientific knowledge. It's become a reality of the modern world, and one that poses far-reaching questions about human development, technological change, cultural values, 
social justice, and global cooperation. In short, it's about everything. Even in the 1980s, when I first started studying climate change, an argument could have been made even then, I think, that the most important questions raised by the idea of a changing climate were not primarily scientific, such as climate change attribution or climate prediction. Even then, one could argue, it was clear that the questions being raised here demanded political and practical responses around questions of sustainable energy, equitable development in the world, uh, and societal adaptation to extreme weather. However, you may want to agree or disagree with me about that contention, we are all agreed, I think, now nearly four decades later, that it is these political questions, long-standing in many cases, these are not new in many regards. These questions are now even more acute. The obstacles to implementing complex changes at the level of societies and multiple societies around the world are fully political, economic, cultural, psychological, and ethical. I don't believe that the obstacles to change reside in the deficiency of scientific knowledge nor even in some deficit of public understanding of climate science. And, and if one took that science first approach, which I disagree with, then dangerous, that implies that more science or better science or better communicated science or publics that could just understand science better would somehow pave the way for easier politics and better policy making. Well, I don't believe that's the case. The questions that lie at the heart of these difficult national and international politics, the questions that are going to confront the government delegates at Glasgow next month, cannot be answered by science. Questions such as, how can a just transition away from a fossil fuel global energy economy be delivered without stranding millions of livelihoods? especially amongst the global poor. Who should bear the financial burdens of that transition? Rich people like us or rich countries also like us? How can the self-interest of nation states best be aligned to secure global cooperation on reconfiguring development pathways and adapting to climate risks? And what is the desirable balance between culture-based, for example, diet, nature-based, for example, the forestation, or technology-based, for example, hydrogen fuel vehicles, what's the balance between those different types of solutions that we are uh, looking towards? Or, grandest of all, if you will, and this is something I've done some work on myself, should radical climate engineering technology, uh, technologies that attempt to stabilize the climate, either by spraying particles into the stratosphere or trying to refreeze the Arctic, should we be contemplating those types of radical technological interventions? Anyway, that's just a flavor of the sort of questions that I think lie at the heart of this complex phenomenon, problem, reality of our modern world. Our panelists are going to offer various perspectives on different aspects of this. Uh, and I hope through their contributions and our discussion, it'll help us to calibrate our expectations uh, from the Glasgow Conference of the Parties. So let me now introduce our four panelists, uh, and then I will invite them uh, in turn to offer short remarks, 10 or 12 minutes or so, um, one after the other, and then uh, we'll open uh, with a conversation uh, amongst ourselves um, before we move on to the uh, open Q&A after the break. So uh, Lavanya Rajamani, our first speaker, who is joining us uh, online, is Professor of International Environmental Law at the University of Oxford and Yamani Fellow in Public International Law at St. Peter's College. Lavanya writes, teaches and advises on international climate change law and policy. And her latest book, just newly published, is a, a new edition of the Oxford Handbook of International Environmental Law. She's currently serving as a coordinating lead author of the chapter on international cooperation on the IPCC's sixth assessment report. 
and her academic work on international climate, the climate regime is informed by her own extensive legal uh, practice. James Miller is a student at Pembroke College studying natural sciences and is also an environmental activist and filmmaker. He started making short films about climate change and biodiversity at the age of 13. And his various forms of awareness raising has taken him to the Channel 4 newsroom and to number 10 Downing Street, amongst other uh, venues. He's coordinated several initiatives, uh, including an online concert featuring Olivia Rodrigo to raise money for conservation uh, and the installation of the Glasgow Climate Clock. Uh, Lee DeWitt is a lecturer in political psychology uh, and fellow of Trinity Hall, Cambridge. His research focuses on the psychology of political decision-making, particularly how individual differences in our values, beliefs, and cognitive styles how these shape our political preferences. Uh, so Lee's research explores how a deeper understanding of this psychology can help address societal challenges such as climate change, uh, and also more broadly, the tendencies that we observe in many societies towards public polarization on many of these questions. Uh, and then Emma Howard Boyd, is chair of the Environment Agency and ex officio board member of DEFRA, Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, and interim chair of the Green Finance Initiative. Emma serves on several boards and advisory committees, too many to mention, but including <laughs> advisor to the Board of Trade, co chair of the Coalition for Climate Resilience Investment the European Climate Foundation and the Council for Sustainable Business. Emma was also UK Commissioner on, uh, to the Global Commission on Adaptation between 2018 and 2021. So uh, a wonderful array and mixture of expertise. And so to start, I will invite uh, Lavanya uh, to offer her opening remarks for us. Thank you, Mike, for your kind introduction and for inviting me to be part of this stimulating discussion and panel. To answer the question of what should come from COP26, I would like to begin by drawing a distinction between the COP as a moment for global reckoning on climate change, a mega event, as my co-author Dan Budansky calls it, and the COP as a UN negotiating process. We can and should expect tremendous things from the COP as a moment of global reckoning on climate change, especially in light of the statements from the IPCC six assessment report in August, including um, stressing and underlining the point that you made, Mike, in your opening remarks, the unequivocal nature of the scientific evidence on anthropogenic climate change. We should, however, manage our expectations on what we can expect of the COP as a UN negotiating process to deliver because the COP as a UN negotiating process cannot deliver what is not on its negotiated agenda. And what is on its agenda is primarily to complete the rule book, to operationalize the Paris Agreement, in particular, the technical rules relating to markets and some aspects of transparency. We can hope and expect the COP to produce this. But as a moment for global reckoning, as I said, we should expect a lot more from the COP as an event, as a mega event, and as a moment for global reckoning, we should leave the COP, we should be able to leave the COP with a very clear sense of momentum and political will to put the world on track to well below two degrees centigrade and the aspirational but increasingly crucial 1.5 degrees centigrade identified in the Paris Agreement. We are not there yet. To be clear, getting there will include commitments not just on greenhouse gas mitigation, but also on finance and support for developing countries. More broadly, 2020 was meant to be the year for states, at least those with five-year targets to update their nationally determined contributions. But it has taken states much longer because of COVID to get these in. We are still waiting for updated nationally determined contributions from about 70 countries, including India and China. But we shouldn't focus just on the contributions from those states that are yet to come in, because those that have already come in don't add up to what's necessary and they don't, will not make up 
for the inadequacies of those that have not come in. The NDCs or the nationally determined contributions that have been submitted uh, according to the Framework Convention on Climate Change Secretariat, um, they produced an NDC synthesis report on 17 September 2017, looking at these NDCs, they note that the total global greenhouse gas emission levels in 2030, assuming all these nationally determined contributions are actually implemented, is expected to be about 16% above the 2010 level in 2030. According to the IPCC's 1.5 degree report, the special report that came out in 2018, greenhouse gas emissions need to be 45% below 2010 by 2030 not 16% above 2010 levels by 2030, which is where we're going to be. And they need to reach net zero by 2050 to give us a fighting chance of meeting our 1.5 degree goal. So we are clearly very, very far from where we need to be. States have been much more ambitious and forthcoming in relation to mid-century net zero greenhouse gas targets and announcements. So not targets and announcements or contributions for the short term, but for mid-century um, mid uh, contributions and announcements, there's been a lot more ambition demonstrated with respect to the long term. Over 130 states have announced these targets, and if they're taken seriously and implemented, potentially the increase in temperature could be limited to approximately two degrees. However, there are many questions relating to the credibility of these net zero targets the accountability of these net zero targets and the fairness of these net zero targets. And I'd like to illustrate with just a few examples, the kinds of issues there are with these targets. So for instance, in relation to credibility, we don't know to what extent these targets are anchored in national and in international law. Nationally, are they in legally binding instruments? Are, are they just announcements? Are they actually just uh, policy? Internationally, are they reflected in the nationally determined contributions that states have uh, put in? Are they reflected in the long-term strategies that states are encouraged to prepare and submit? There is a mismatch, as far as we can see, between the announcement of these targets, as I said, over 130 countries have announced these, and the anchoring of these in international law. This is something we can ask the COP or expect the COP to ask of states to anchor their long-term mid-century net zero targets and announcements into the COP process or into the negotiating process. The second aspect of the credibility question is a substantive one about the extent to which these long-term goals are actually aligned with short-term actions. Are these aligned or is there a mismatch between long-term goals and short-term actions? And these are questions that are now being asked, of course. The German Federal Constitutional Court uh, decision in the Neubauer case addressed this issue. Other courts will too. Is the long term being aligned with the short term? Are hard decisions and choices being left for later, for others and for future generations, on the assumption that there will be an overshoot in the short term? There's an extensive reliance in a lot of these scenarios where the short term does not align with the long term. Um, on negative emissions. And there are fairness dimensions to this, both in terms of inter and intragenerational equity. Again, courts are beginning to, to look at these issues, especially cases brought by youth act activists in, in the German constitutional court case, as well as in, in Australia. The second set of questions relating to these net zero targets relates to accountability. There is very little accountability for these long-term net zero goals uh, in relation to the shorter term NDCs. As I've just indicated, many of these net zero goals are not embedded in the UN or Paris Agreement processes, especially in Article 419, where there's a potential hook for them to be embedded. Um, Article 419 requires or encourages states to put in place long-term low greenhouse gas uh, uh, development strategies. So the accountability that has been demanded of states has been demanded primarily by non-state actors and from outside the UN climate change regime, not within the regime itself. So a key question we need to ask is how we generate accountability for these long-term net zero targets at the international and national level. The final set of questions relating to net zero targets relates to fence. So the Paris Agreement recognizes that peaking of emissions will happen later in developing countries and that net zero has to be achieved on the basis of equity and in the context of sustainable development and efforts to eradicate poverty. 
However, the call for global emissions to reach net zero by 2050 is being seamlessly translated into a call for each and every country to announce net zero greenhouse gas targets by 2050. In recent months, um, the US, UK, and even the UN Secretary General has actually suggested that these net zero emission targets um, need to be for every country. And it's an important pledge or a yeah, important pledge that is expected of all the major emitters. Uh, but how much each country has to do depends on how fast other countries reach net zero. So in this context, it's worth pausing to ask if adopting a net zero target is, is the answer for every country, whatever its situation. It is a simple and sort of understand, understandable rallying cry, uh, but it's not the obvious choice perhaps for every country and every country has its own transition to uh, a, a decarbonized economy. Some countries might need to go further faster to make room for others to get there a little later, as for instance, uh, India with energy, serious energy poverty issues. So to conclude, we need to ask these questions around interlinked issues of credibility, accountability, and fairness of net zero targets. And this, in this, the UN negotiating process can play a role. The overarching conference decision emerging from Glasgow could encourage states to anchor their net zero targets in the Paris Agreement process so as to enhance its credibility, accountability, and fairness. And so as to ensure that the long-term targets that states have been so forthcoming with are actually aligned with the short-term nationally determined contributions that they're putting in place, which do not put us on track to a 1.5 degree or even a well below two degree target. Anchoring long-term targets in the UN process will go a long way towards ensuring that we're on track to stabilizing climate change to acceptable limits. So to conclude, from COP as a mega event, from the COP as a moment for global reckoning, we need to, we need to see a very clear political will to put the world on track to well below two degrees centigrade and aspiring to 1.5 degrees centigrade. And that can only happen if we anchor the long-term targets and align them with the short-term targets that states have put into the process. And these short-term targets, as I've said, do not uh, take us where we need to go. So we need to anchor these in the UN process and we need the COP to encourage states to do that um, so as to ensure that we leave with a fighting chance of getting to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Thank you. It's not the first time I've been on a panel where everyone else knows more about the topic than I do, uh, but it is the first time where half the audience might do as well. So I've had to be quite cunning in what I choose to speak to you all about today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the youth climate movement, which is something I do know really well because I've been a part of it for almost seven years now. And I also think that our activities make up a really important aspect of what needs to come out of COP26 this year as well. But before I go into that, I'd like to give you a bit of context to start off with as to what the challenges that young people face when looking at these issues. As Lavanya mentioned, the IPCC assessment report was released earlier this year, and that gave an updated carbon budget for 1.5 degrees. That's the amount of time we have left before we emit enough CO2 to take us over that critical temperature threshold of warming. And according to current rates of annual emissions, we're going to exceed that in less than eight years. And again, as Lebanya mentioned, we can still avoid that, but it will require us to halve global annual emissions by 2030, which we're way off track to do. So if you look at this from the perspective of my generation and you combine that knowledge with the fact that the average age of British MPs is around 50, of CEOs is about 54, and world leaders, that number is even higher, then by the time my generation is in the decision-making seats, it will be far too late. It seems like we were born just in time to see the world fall to pieces around us and just too late to do anything about it. And that for so many people in my generation has led to hopelessness and to despair, but not to all of them. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'd like to kick off by taking you back in time to the US general election, not the last one, but the one before the 2016 election between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. In that election, climate change did not come up as a question in any of the presidential debates, not once. It was really depressing. 
But if you fast forward four years to the 2020 election, there was a seven hour dedicated town hall event run by CNN purely dedicated to climate change. And mid campaign Joe Biden also transformed from being one of the least ambitious candidates on climate change to being now one of the most ambitious world leaders on the global stage. How did this happen? Well, I think there were several contributing factors, but the one that I want to focus on today is the Sunrise Movement. They were founded in the wake of the general election in 2017. And in that space of a single election cycle, they completely transformed the political landscape on climate change. They started out by lobbying the Democratic Party with a sit-in protest in Nancy Pelosi's office. Uh, they then went on to support the most climate ambitious candidates in the Democratic primaries. And when eventually Joe Biden won those, they sent him an open letter asking him to step up his game, which he did. Um, and then having done that, they knew that it would all be for nothing if Trump won the election. So they went on to contact 3.5 million young voters in the US directly, plus tens of millions more on social media. And they did this in a tactical way. They did it targeted at swing states. And in some of those states that year, the youth vote increased by 600% based on the previous election cycle. Now, that's not necessarily causation, but research did show <clears throat> that uh, telling young people about Biden's climate plan was the single most effective way to mobilize them to vote for him. And it actually, interestingly, also turns out that those youth votes were really important to the overall result of the election, because in many of those swing states, the net gain of votes for Biden from the election completely overwhelmed the overall margin of victory. So I think that's one example of a really impressive way that young people, despite not being in the actual decision-making roles, have played a really important role in national scale politics and global scale politics um, from that perspective. But it's not only in politics that young people are making a difference. There's also litigation. Um, there's a team of young climate activists in Portugal, I think is a particularly impressive case that they're bringing against 33 countries in the European Court of Human Rights. And if they succeed, those countries will be compelled not only to ramp up their emissions reductions targets, but also to deal with their international contribution to climate change as well. And that's something that I don't think has ever been done before. So it's really exciting to me. Uh, there's also other cases being brought in Peru relating to deforestation of the Amazon, uh, in Australia relating to ministers' duty of care to look after children and protect them from climate change, and on, in the US as well over air pollution. And in all of these cases, they're being brought forward by youth plaintiffs. It's really cool. Uh, but as important as it is, I think, to influence policy and law in this way, there are young people who are not waiting for politicians to do what they should have done decades ago, and they're getting their heads down right now and protecting all that they can. And I think one good example of this is an organization that I've been really lucky to work with called Reserve of the Youth Land Trust. And this year, we created the world's first entirely youth-funded nature reserve in Ecuador's cloud forest. And this is one of the most vulnerable areas in the world to deforestation. It's also one of the most biodiverse areas on the planet. So it's a really important area to conserve. And we raised enough money to protect a 244-acre expansion of a pre-existing site based entirely off money raised by young people through weekend jobs, through sponsored runs. Um, I ran two charity concerts, as mentioned earlier, cake sales, everything. Um, and we think that through this, we built a model that can now be scaled up to protect habitats in biomes all around the world. And actually, we have um, some new sources of funding coming through this year that should allow us to protect habitats on a completely new scale, um, which is very, very exciting. Boyan Slat as well, I think I have time for one more example. Um, he's a Dutch inventor and entrepreneur who at the age of just 18, created a system to rid the oceans of plastic. That's younger than I am now. Uh, and it's thought, he thinks that with this system, he can get rid of 90% of the ocean's floating plastic by 2040. It's just incredible. So I hope that brief whistle-stop tour of the youth climate movement and the wider youth environmental movement has shown how we can use our political, our legal, and our financial power all to make a difference, even though we aren't in those decision-making spaces ourselves. But now, turning to the topic specifically of this seminar, we've got to look forward to COP26 and what comes out of that summit. 
And there are several ways in which we are directly engaged in that summit. Um, there's, of course, going to be youth strikes going on in a coordinated fashion all over the world. Uh, that's on Friday, the 5th of November. So that's going to hopefully turn up the heat for the second week of negotiations. Um, there's also going to be loads of youth led events and talks at the event, uh, at COP26. And there was one I really wanted to tell you all about today, but unfortunately, the government haven't signed up on it yet, so I can't. Uh, but it's related to climate education. That's as much as I'm allowed to say. Um, there's also uh, capacities for us to be formally involved in the negotiation processes through the UN's youth constituency called Youngo. And that gives us the capacity to have meetings with parties and negotiators, to make interventions in negotiations and to hold press conferences, all with the aims of having our voices heard by political leaders. So that's something. But there are a few young people who are in those decision-making seats themselves. In 2019, at the last COP, uh, a lady called Marie-Claire Graf from Switzerland led negotiations for her country on adaptation and resilience at the age of just 23. 23, that doesn't feel too far away from where I am now. So it's quite incredible. Um, so that's, that's really exciting. They're few and far between, but there are a few people who are actually going to be uh, actually doing negotiations from the perspective of young people. So turning from there also, I am going to be personally involved in COP26 in some capacity as well. Uh, and a lot of it revolves around that object there, which some of you may have been curious about. I'm just gonna try and uh, turn it on, see if it works. There we go. I've actually gone in seconds. Um, and it relates to um, the theme that Lavanya was speaking about actually just before, um, a very specific, um, but also in another way, a very general topic of ambition. Uh, and I don't know if any of you saw the climate clock that was set up in New York last year, um, but I did. It saw um, unprecedented press attention all around the world. It was seen by, I think, more than a billion people. Um, and I think it made a really powerful statement as to the time that we have left to tackle these issues uh, and what we need to do to get there. Uh, the basic concept, I hope it's turned on. It's not, it is. Fantastic. Um, it shows two numbers. So the top number there in red is our deadline. That's counting down um, the time we have left before we overrun our carbon budget for 1.5 degrees, as I spoke about earlier. That critical temperature threshold above which a lot of the worst impacts of climate change will start to kick in. But the second number is a bit more optimistic. That's our lifeline. That's our source of hope. That's counting up the percentage of the world's energy generated by renewable resources. And if we can bring that up towards 100% as quickly as possible, then that will buy us more time on the deadline too, because our global annual emissions will start to decrease. So I was really inspired by that clock. I thought it made a really powerful statement. And so I got in touch with the creators of that clock in New York uh, and also Glasgow City Council and a number of other partners and brought them together. And we set up a new one in Glasgow um, ahead of COP26. And it's just like that, what you see there, the same two numbers, but it's a light projection and it's seven stories tall. Uh, <laughs> it's a massive monument from the science. And our hope is that it will look down on world leaders as they're making these crucial negotiations on the future of my generation and of generations to come. And it will instill in them that same sense of urgency that young people like me feel every single day. But that's not the end of it either, because I'm going to be bringing my little portable handheld clock to the summit itself into the delegation space, as long as the armed guards don't shoot me, because it does look a bit like a ticking bomb. Um, and also several country delegations, hopefully, I think Ghana and South Korea may be bringing in some portable clocks as well. And I think the clock illustrates one final point that I'd like to finish on which is that COP26, yes, it's a vital series of political negotiations that are going to have consequences for decades to come, but it's also an opportunity for mass public communication, okay? And that's what the clock for me represents and what young people, I think, can play such a huge role in. Because adults often, when they see us teenagers out on the streets, they see us as like broadcasting our fear and our anger, which I think we are to some extent. But what they don't see is what's behind that and what's driving it is a huge amount of hope. Proactive, 
passionate hope that is making a difference, a real world difference on every corner of the globe. And it's just my wish that in a few weeks time, when this summit itself comes around, we'll have an opportunity to share that with the rest of the world as well. Thank you, James. That was uh, very inspiring. I can also say with confidence that I will know less about climate change than my members of the panel and the audience. Uh, but I will say some things about political psychology that I think uh, might be helpful. And I will, in, in a sense, echo James's point that I think what needs to come from COP26 is not just the policy agreements, but a sense of uh, the communication strategy and the vision for what is going to bring the world uh, together and forward to, to tackle these challenges. And I'm going to talk through a bit about the psychology of how that needs navigating, I think. First, I want to say that um, as a psychologist, I'm not just worried about climate change for the impact that it will have on our natural world. I'm also really concerned about the impact that it will have on the functioning of Western democratic societies, societies around the world more generally. We know from human psychology that when societies are placed under stress, when people operate in a world that is governed by a conception of resource scarcity, uh, then aspects of human psychology kick in uh, that can lead us into quite dangerous and uncooperative spaces. And I think there's a real risk with climate change, not just of the immediate environmental impact, but the deterioration of the kind of world order that we've come to uh, rely on. Um, and so the, there's the psychology around that, um, the, the risk that comes from that. Uh, but I am also optimistic uh, that, that things can change, but that we need to understand the psychology of that as to how that's going to happen. And it seems pretty likely to me now that changing people's behavior is going to have to be a short-term component of how we tackle climate change. It's gonna be one of the bits of our arsenal of how we tackle climate change in the short term. Um, but what we know about changing behavior is that it doesn't happen easily. It doesn't happen spontaneously. Really, behavior change happens when you change the context in which people are living their daily lives, change the choice architectures in which people are living. But that's going to require governments to step up and be prepared to make those changes to people's uh, living environments. Um, and it, on an abstract level, populations around the world now say that they do want governments to take more action. You know, the, the consciousness of climate change as an issue has raised massively over the last five years. Um, and there's been lots of polls out over the last year or so highlighting there's a huge consensus that more action needs to be taken on climate change. My, my lab, together with Sandra van der Linden, has worked, run one of these polls with YouGov over seven countries, highlighting that there's a huge consensus that we need to take more action, uh, that all governments need to take more action at COP. But when it comes down to you know, a low traffic neighborhood in your area of London, or when it comes down to high fuel prices in France, or when it comes down to closing Mill Road in Cambridge, uh, you know, when you take that abstract willingness for there to be change into some concrete change in people's lives, there is a lot of resistance to it still. Uh, and we face this democratic dilemma whereby, yes, people might want in the abstract for things to be done about climate change, but actually when it interferes with people's day-to-day -day lives, people are still resistant to it. Um, and so I think COP26 offers a huge opportunity from a psychological perspective in that regard that I hope our leaders around the world recognize that if this is used as a point in time to say, hey, look, this isn't just something that we're doing as a country. This is something that's collectively, uh, you know, we're making sacrifices here to change the way we're living to tackle climate change. But this isn't just something we're doing as a country. This is something countries around the world are doing. And there's a huge opportunity for collective responsibility there that I really hope COP takes up. Also looking at what things COP could offer, again, I can't talk about you know, what policies are actually gonna be more effect, most effective, but from a psychological perspective, it's clear that some things are very popular. So planting trees, for example, is a hugely popular policy around the world. Now I know there are huge debates about the efficacy of that in tackling climate change and how effectively it can be done. But from a psychological perspective, I think planting trees is great because it gives people a foot in the door to tackling the problem. It gives them something kind of concrete that people can do and contribute to. Um, I love that next year the Queen is running this Queen, Queen's Green Canopy, this plan to plant lots of trees across the country. I think that's a great sort of utilization of a sense of national pride to contribute to a, a process of tackling climate change and giving people an action that they can, they can take. Now, I know there's some debate about whether actions like that can look tokenistic, but I think from a psychological perspective, the evidence is that 
Once someone takes a foot in the door, once someone starts on a journey of addressing something, once they take one behavior towards addressing something, they might be more open to taking others. And so I think tree planting has huge potential for that reason. Um, but you know, there are easy options, there are easy wins like that, but a lot of things are gonna be very hard. A lot of people, changes are gonna be very hard to persuade people of. But not impossible. We've seen with COVID that we can make rapid and dramatic changes to the way in which we live. So some conception that humans just don't have the capacity to make these kinds of changes, I think is flawed. Uh, but you know, there, there are huge things that are required to make that kind of movement. And we've learned some things about the changes in COVID that I think will be important in navigating the changes of climate change. One thing is that institutional trust was a really important predictor of adopting COVID mitigation strategies around the world. It's a huge predictor of vaccine uptake around the world. So a sense of institutional trust is really important in bringing populations on board with you. Uh, and that's why I think one of the things that also needs to come from COP is, is more active legislation to combat the spread of misinformation on social media, that there's only so much from a psychological point of view that people can do to resist misinformation that we need legislation to stop the spread of misinformation through social media. Without that, there's a huge risk to undermining uh, trust in, in, in the institutions that are trying to take the action necessary to tackle climate change. We need to reduce misinformation, but I also think that there needs to be more prominent information uh, in, the, in the social domain, like I think with this excellent clock. Um, there was a really interesting review of articles published in the New York Times between uh, 1980 and uh, 19. Uh, in 2018, finding that of five really salient facts about what's going on with climate change, only one or 2% of those articles ever mentioned those key facts. Uh, and so people are hugely under-informed from our media uh, as to what's really going on uh, with climate change. There was a poll in the UK from the King's Policy Institute that asked people to rank what they thought were some of the most effective actions to tackle climate change, and many of them responded that recycling was one of the most effective ones, which we know actually is one of the least effective ones. But this is what the majority of people said. You know, this isn't a failure of human intelligence. This is a failure of, of, of science communication. Um, but there, there is going to be, so there's a role for the media, there's a role for combating misinformation. Uh, but I also think there's a question of framing. Um, I think that we have a lot to learn about how to uh, frame messaging effectively uh, to persuade people and bring people on board with us. And actually, we probably need to learn something from Dominic Cummings in this. He recognized before the Brexit referendum that people tend to be resistant to change. And he understood that and he understand the loss of version around that. He read around the behavioral science of this. And so he cleverly framed the, the referendum in terms of take back control, you know, that stop our country being taken away by this, this institutional European power. And I think we need a little bit of that effective communication around climate change that we're not just saying, you know, we need to radically change our world, but actually we need to do these things to preserve our way of life. That unless we do th these things, the, the way of life we enjoy will be taken away from us. Uh, and I think that framing is going to be getting that framing right is going to be really important to bringing people on board with us. Um, and also promoting the wider benefits of tackling climate change. So, you know, the public health benefits, the potential mental health benefits, uh, not just of young people not being stressed out about their future, but also the benefits of, uh, you know, the access to green space that we know is important for uh, improving uh, mental health. Although at the same time, I think we need to be careful about not connecting climate action too heavily to really highly politicized debates. I think there's a risk there of sort of tacking you know, action on climate change to other, every other political thing that you want to achieve, which might actually make climate action uh, more difficult. And all this is necessary because spontaneous behavior change is really hard. We're gonna to have to make changes to, you know, the context in which people make decisions. And that's gonna mean things like, uh, you know, taxing uh, food that is really carbon heavy more and perhaps taxing uh, food that is carbon, uh, you know, not intensively carbon, but taxing that less. Uh, and, and if we're going to bring in policies like that, they have to have they have to be able to command popular support. Uh, finally, uh, I think a key component of this is that these changes need to be seen as fair. Um, that uh, you know those who are contributing the most to emitting uh, 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 carbon need to you know make the biggest sacrifices uh, in in tackling it. And here again, uh, you know, there's been some polling recently suggesting that attacks, for example, on frequent flyers. Uh, would be quite popular in the UK, and more to the point, it would be regarded as fair. 
um, by, by majority of people. And I think that fairness is really crucial. If you're going to bring, bring people with you, if you're going to not have, uh, you know, gilets jaunes protesters out on the streets, uh, th these changes need to be seen uh, as fair and equitable. Okay, yeah, so I think what needs to come from COP is not just, you know, the policies about how we're technically going to tackle it, but thinking why, more broadly about the psychology of how you bring people on board with the huge changes required for us to tackle this crisis. Thank you. Thank you. A huge thank you to the Master for inviting me here to speak today. It's a great pleasure to speak at Pembroke's William Pitt Seminar. Pembroke College, as we know, founded in 1347. And I understand the earliest recording of the gardens is from David Loggan's etching of 1690. But for me, the greatest moment in its history was when my father, one of the first of his family to go to university, attended Pembroke and proposed to my mother in those very same gardens over 60 years ago. Perhaps I'll come back to the gardens. That this, the 16th William Pitt seminar is a part of the Cambridge Zero Festival suggests a melting pot of history, continuity, innovation and change. The conservative, the progressive and the radical learn together here in the spirit of shared endeavor. That is why Cambridge continues to be a fulcrum of this country's fortunes. I'm grateful to Emily Shipborough for opening the Cambridge Zero Festival earlier today with a focus on women and climate. Emily's leadership on this agenda is something I aspire to, so that is where I'll begin. In September, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said to the UN General Assembly, women's equality is essentially a question of power. We must urgently transform our male dominated world and shift the balance of power to solve the most challenging problems of our age. He went on to say that means more women leaders in parliaments, cabinets and boardrooms. It means women fully represented and making their full contribution everywhere. And in her new book, The Authority Gap, journalist Marianne Seacart says, women are more likely to worry about climate change and to believe that it will be harm the future generations. They are also more likely to believe that it will affect them personally. So having more women in positions of decision-making power with people listening to them would help to reduce global warming. This isn't only important in social and environmental terms, it's important for the climate economy. COP26 should send a clear message to governments, the private sector and communities around the world that we need to put more women in positions of power and amplify women's voices at work. And to build on James's point, perhaps more youth as well. Going back in time to December 2015, when the Paris Agreement was signed, I was at COP21 as part of a UK finance delegation calling for the transition to a low carbon economy. I had to leave the negotiating hall to be briefed by the Environment Agency about terrible floods in Carlisle. A reminder that while the climate crisis is global, its impacts are in your village, your shop, your home. In England, more than 76,000 incidents were reported to the Environment Agency's Incident Management Service last year, including flood, drought, fires, fish kills, and pollution incidents. One in every seven minutes, 24 hours a day. Climate change is increasing their severity, frequency, and duration. This summer, some 200 people died in the German floods. However high we build our flood defenses, that will happen here at some point, unless we also make the places where we live, work, and travel resilient to climate shocks. It is adapt or die. The UK's government's official goals for COP26 are, firstly, to secure global net zero by mid-century and keep 1.5 degrees within reach. And secondly, to adapt to protect communities and natural habitats. These are good goals, but once again, the question is pace. COP26 needs to be catalytic. It's not enough to learn the lessons of the past, it's not enough to identify what needs to be done. COP26 needs to boost climate action faster than Jeff Bezos can put William Shatner into space. <laughs> On Wednesday, 
the Environment Agency submitted its third adaptation report to the government under the Climate Change Act. With less than three weeks to COP26, it warns that preparing for climate shocks like floods, heat waves and droughts needs to be integral to government, businesses and communities. This year, the Environment Agency completed the government's six-year capital programme on time and on budget, enhancing flood protection to over 300,000 homes. Then we began the new £5.2 billion flood programme. We've also made 320 abstraction licences more sustainable, returning 47 billion litres of water to the environment, equivalent to supplying over 850,000 people every year. But the report also says the Environment Agency alone cannot protect everyone from climate disruption. This is a whole society effort. Greta Thunberg has talked about cathedral thinking. When we lay the first stone without necessarily knowing what the ceiling will look like, Limiting carbon emissions is the most effective way to combat, combat climate change, but preparing for climate shocks will save millions of lives and livelihoods, help avoid disruption to the low carbon transition, and provide investor confidence. There's no point investing in an energy efficient home that could be washed away in a flood. Which leads us to the world of finance. Finance has immense power to create transformational shifts in what we buy, where we live and work, and how we communicate. I am co-chair of the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment, whose members now represent over $20 trillion in assets. By pricing climate risks, particularly for infrastructure, and including them in upfront financial decision-making, we aim to incentivize a shift towards greater resilience. Such is the urgency of this kind of initiative that last week, the Secretary General asked the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment members to have at least 25 developing countries adopt climate risk assessment methodology to support infrastructure investment decision-making by the end of 2022, to mobilize at least $10 billion from investors to secure capital for resilience by the end of 2022, I think that's too small, and by 2025 make systemic resilience tools available to any developing country as a tool for decision making. Finance is also crucial for reducing emissions. The Transition Pathway Initiative was set up by the Church of England National Investing Bodies and the Environment Agency Pension Fund. It provides analysis of the world's highest emitting companies so that investors can check progress against climate goals. It helps shareholders to use their power to see companies, including fossil fuel companies, align with the Paris Agreement. The TPI shows how much can be achieved by relatively small pots of money when their beneficiaries have a shared goal. It is now supported by investors representing over $40 trillion of combined assets under management and advice, and is a reference point for sustainable bonds as well. I'm glad that finance has been identified as an area of focus at COP26, but once again, this is a question of speed. Unfortunately, this year, the TPI's analysis found that no sector is reducing emissions fast enough to meet the UK's 2050 net zero target. As it stands, investors are not yet bringing their power to make change at the necessary speed. COP26 must change that. Many companies will rise to this challenge, but they will be held back and greener markets will be undermined unless there is strong regulation to underpin progress. This means rules that provide everyone with clarity, consistency and certainty. The level playing field needs well-funded regulators that can provide investors with data about which companies are performing well and which aren't. Sanctions for environmental crimes also need to pose a threat. They must demonstrate that crime doesn't pay. The 90 million pound fine against Southern Water for deliberate pollution this year potentially shifted the dial on the levels of penalties for corporate environmental crime in England. I would like to see the court supply sanctions consistently and proportionately with the most serious breaches by very large companies attracting sanctions based on a percentage of turnover. More attention should be paid to the directors of companies that are guilty of repeated deliberate breaches of environmental law. 
It is a failing of the current system that some people can move from company to company without fear of recrimination. Such directors should be struck off and in the most grievous cases, custodial sentences are right. However, despite con constant refinement of regulatory enforcement, it remains the case that some people are getting rich while the environment pays the price. Society-wide change depends not just on deterrence actions, but also the change in corporate culture un under pressure from shareholders. We are trying to deliver this through the environmental performance assessments of the water companies, but perhaps we could go further. The Environment Agency has huge oversight of many sectors in the UK. We could start to think about giving not just shareholders, but also insurers and lenders of a fuller picture of how the companies are actually performing on the ground. A decade on from the financial crisis, and many investors still do not fully understand the esoteric financial products that their money is tied up in, let alone how their investments connect to environmental degradation. As green finance moves into the mainstream, environmental regulators need to keep in lockstep with economic and financial regulators outpacing climate change and matching the scale of the challenge. In short, COP26 must deliver investment and crooks and laggards mustn't be allowed to hold everyone else back. Today, I've talked about the importance of female leadership. I've talked about adaptation and finance. And I've talked about regulation and enforcement. The unifying theme is urgency. The heat wave in Vancouver, the floods in Germany, the drought in Madagascar, the polar vortex in Texas. It is nearly midnight in our race against the climate emergency. There is still time to take action and there is still time to find opportunity in that action, but only just. The glorious gardens of Pembroke have stood for centuries, yet we can only ever have one lifetime to enjoy their seasons. COP26 must deliver action that shows the people of the world we are alive to our own desperate fleeting chance. As Cambridge alumnus William Wordsworth wrote, not in utopia, subterranean fields or some secreted island, heaven knows where, but in the very world, which is the world of all of us, the place where in the end we find our happiness or not at all. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you to all for one, uh, keeping to time, being absolutely on message and actually opening up some really, really fascinating questions. So be thinking about the ones that you want to ask our panel. Your time isn't quite yet. Those are people who are watching online have a slight advantage in that you can actually start uh, submitting your questions. Uh, Kate, I think, is going to be monitoring those. Um, so that's an open invitation at this stage. Also remember that the Twitter uh, uh, tag is uh, hashtag WPS2021 uh, if you're wanting to tweet about anything that you've heard so far. So we're going to take about half an hour um, uh, and I'm going to try and draw out maybe some themes or maybe some tensions or maybe ask some questions that I don't feel have been answered. Um, to see if the panelists uh, want to tackle any of those. Um, and I'm going to start off, uh, COP in November 2021, should of course have happened in November 2020 in Glasgow. It didn't, and we all know the reason why it didn't. Uh, so it's been delayed because of COVID-19. And I, I know uh, Lee, I think, mentioned COVID uh, briefly in your presentation. And maybe this was just a, a general opening question to, to all of the panelists. Do you think that the last 18 months of observing how the world has grappled with and sought to navigate through the real challenges and uh, dangers and risks of COVID-19 has got anything to tell us about either how the COP should be thinking or more broadly, how we should be uh, finding our way and navigating our way through the challenges of climate change. So from your different perspectives on that we've heard from, do you think we can learn anything at all? Or is actually the nature of COVID entirely different from the nature of climate change? And maybe I'll start off with Lavinia um, because you're joining us from Oxford. <laughs> 
Thank you, Mike. I suspect this is a question much more for Lee, uh, but um, I'm happy to talk briefly in relation to the international process itself. COVID has obviously had um, had has had quite an impact on the process, as you uh, pointed out. Uh, it was you know the COP COP26 was meant to be held last year, and it's it's delayed a year. There have been many questions about. Uh, the nature of participation, especially of developing countries uh, in these negotiations, given sort of the um, the uh, the quarantine requirements, differential quarantine requirements for many developing countries, and the uh, uh, I guess the differential sort of rate at which vaccination has proceeded in uh, in other countries of the world. And I think one of the things that I take away from that is that issues of fairness and equity. Um, that have uh, sort of plagued the sort of vaccination debate or the sort of more generally um, uh, discussions around COVID um, have uh, have a very important role to play also in the climate change context and have al always had a very important role to play in the climate change context. And to the extent that we can't resolve these equity and fairness issues, we don't have a sense of ownership of the solution, whether it's whether it's to COVID uh, or or to climate change. And I think, uh, to me, I take away from, uh, from the entire sort of uh, phase, which we are not out of yet. Uh, it's part of the reason I guess I'm, I'm uh, speaking from Oxford. Um, but you know, what I take away from this entire uh, uh, phase is that um, there are some issues of equity and fairness which we need to address uh, across issue areas. And we need to address them uh, in the climate change context as well to ensure that everyone has a sense of ownership of uh, the direction of travel that we're going in and to have a fighting chance of actually meeting the goals, global goals that we've set for ourselves. Thank you. I mean, just to push you on that fairness and equity, but actually, I mean, one reading of, of the whole vaccination program internationally and COVAX is actually, this is not an auspicious example, uh, that if we can't do this in relation to an acute pressing existential uh, pandemic, how are we actually going to address those uh, global uh, questions of equity and justice in relation to climate change? It, it, ha, 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 this, is, this has not been a good dress rehearsal. No, I'm not suggesting that it has. I'm just suggesting <laughs> I'm just suggesting that we need to buck up on this issue and um, and we need we need to find ways of doing this at least for the climate change emergency in ways that we've not found uh, in ourselves to be able to do for the COVID emergency. Okay, th thank you, Lavanya. Can I move to Lee? Because you mentioned about institutional trust is really important in, in thinking about COVID policies. Can you just elaborate on that and whether you think actually we can learn something from the COVID case and in, into the climate change case about how do, how do we how do we how do we build in, in, institutional trust so that publics actually have more confidence in decision makers or politicians, or actually how we, we can. How we, how we can lose institutional trust. Mm, mm, mm. I hope you don't mind if I jump back a bit a second first okay. to uh, just talk about, do you remember when just before lockdown was coming and there was all this conversation around behavioural fatigue and the idea we couldn't go into lockdown in the UK because people would never manage to you know, restrict their behaviours in that way. Um, and at the time, uh, myself and 200 other behavioural scientists wrote a letter in, uh, saying this just isn't right. You know, that we're working under such unknown... Uh, you know, context here that we can't just think that this is going to play out how we might expect. And so that, you know, the government sort of held back going into lockdown, which everyone could see was what needed to happen in a way that really contravened what behavioral scientists were, were advising. Um, and, you know, it turns out it was possible for us to massively change and restrict our behavior, although we have seen significant protests to that. And that change hasn't been sustainable. You know, we haven't been able to live like that forever which is part of what I mean, if we're going to have sustainable change, behavior change, you need to change the context in which we're living, not just sort of hope and that we can motivate people into changing their behavior. Um, but yeah, and, you know, even with all that science around uh, COVID and the necessity of doing that, there's been a you know, lack of trust in the necessity for lockdowns, there's been a lack of trust in the vaccines. Um, and so um, obviously psychologists have been interested in looking at the predictors of that, and Michael Bang peterson in particular has been doing surveys uh, across countries in the world, finding that trust in institutions is one of the best predictors of vaccine uptake. We're lucky here in the UK that the NHS is a hugely trusted institution. If it was just down to trust in Boris, I'm not quite sure where we'd be standing uh, on that. Um, in terms of 
Um, how you gain trust? I mean, it's really interesting. Uh, I did some um, I did some focus groups a little while back, and we asked people at the end, sort of, you know, all these political things you've told us. Who would you like to be the messenger to go and tell a politician these things in your stead? Uh, and they all said David Attenborough. Um, really interesting. I mean, spontaneously, you know, lots of them just said David Attenborough. Um, and I think it's really interesting how he. I, I think his weighing in to the issue has been really significant. Um, and I think also, you know, that's one of the reasons why. I really love that the Queen is running this plant a tree, you know, program um, uh, uh, next year because I think we need to make use of trusted civic institutions like that as you know, as messengers that aren't necessarily politicised, aren't necessarily perceived as partisan. So people can't sort of dismiss what they're saying as oh, that person's got an agenda to you know manipulate me for some reason. I think having actors like that being able to step up at times like this is really important. OK, thank you. I, I'm going to come back, actually, to this question about, about politicians and trusted actors and, and who actually we see as the more important figures in this debate. But can I come to James? Uh, 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 I mean, from a youth, a youth movement perspective around climate change, do you think the question of COVID has uh, engaged young, young people in ways that are any way significant or relevant? the ways in which you think about campaigning on climate change has evolved over the seven years that you've been involved in this. Has COVID taught you anything at all, do you think? I mean, it's, been, it's been really difficult um, because, of course, I think one of the main ways in which many young people got involved before the pandemic was with the school strikes that were happening every single Friday. And of course, um, since uh, was it March of last year, they had to stop entirely. Um, and so what went from being such a mainstream issue in our generation I feel has slightly taken the back seat since the pandemic started. Um, but beyond that, a lot of people have been getting outdoors a lot more often. I think that was something that has happened across generations, but was perhaps particularly um, helpful for, for our generation, those who were going through exams at the time, getting outside um, and appreciating all the benefits that that brought us in a really difficult year. Um, and I hope that that's had some reflection on how people see the natural world and our, our interactions with it and how important and valuable it is to us, not just on a global scale, but also our local wild spaces and the areas that we have more impact over and more potential to protect ourselves. Thank you. Uh, Emma, do you have any thoughts on, on the COVID question? Is there, is there anything in, in the realms that you've been working in over the last 18 months around uh, with, with COVID that you think has actually altered or potentially can alter some of these climate change challenges? I think it's important that we recognise some of the, the negative things that have happened, but there have also been some incredibly positive things that have happened on the back. Um, acceleration of decision making around home working, uh, the fact that we don't have to all be in the same room in order to have a conversation like this. And, and I, so I do, I do think we need to look at some of those ways that technology is now helping us meet in different ways. I don't want to do without face-to-face um, -face, um, meeting, in-person meetings. The, the, the other thing that I really um, think is, imp is important is where uh, businesses have got together to work on accelerating their focus on the climate agenda too, on the back of that real interest in the natural environment. It's great to see Johnson Cox here in the audience, who uh, is a fellow chair of the economic regulator of the water companies Offwat. And uh, we worked together with the water companies to accelerate a green recovery program, which led to accelerated investment in some uh, environmental projects linked with the, the water sector. And I, I do think this interest at a community and local level in the environment, whilst sometimes it's quite painful because uh, the interest in things like water quality has shot up, uh, it's also been really important that people aren't now caring about these things. And uh, so with, whether it's youth activists, local activists, I think this has absolutely put the environment and climate change on the agenda in a way um, that it wasn't necessarily before the, um, the pandemic. So it's not all good, but there are some glimmers of hope in amongst um, how we've experienced the last 18 months, two years. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, what the next area I just wanted to, to, to focus on is something that, again, came up in, in different ways, actually, in all, I think in all four of your 
comments and, and, and contributions, um, which is the role of the courts, with the role of the legal system uh, in, in this. Um, and it, it came out in different settings, and, and, and obviously Lavagna is a, a professor of international uh, environmental law, um, will have some particular perspectives on this. Um, Lee, you mentioned something about challenge, you know, the democratic dilemma here, uh, which I guess points to this question between how publics are um, either uh, nudged or enabled to participate in decision making um, with respect to democratic institutions. Um, I think James, you mentioned a little bit about this, uh, and, and Emma particularly, certainly in the role of uh, your crooks and uh, what was it, your crooks and laggards, I think, uh, and a need actually for much stronger legislation, which engages the judiciary. And so my question here, and, and this, you know, for many people has become one of the lightning rod questions about climate change, is that is climate change a problem of such a nature that certainly in those societies like ours where we're used to democratic institutions and public participation in those democratic institutions that we actually can no longer afford that the slow cycles of decision making which often take policy in directions that are not conducive to bringing climate change under control uh, and is the other courts then actually an institution within democracies that are going to become ever increasingly important in the way in which our societies are being governed. Parliaments have had their day. The courts are now going to guide our societies and the world into a safer environment. Can I just get your thoughts on that question? Um, and again, I mean, maybe I'll start, Lavanya, with, with you with, um, as a lawyer. Um, how, how would you read that question I'm raising here between the judiciary and the role of the elected representatives of the people in democracies, which is the parliament? That's a great question. I think in terms of the role of climate litigation and the judiciary, um, at least from the perspective of international law, I think there's some very... Uh, serious gaps in particular in relation to ambition in the international climate change governance architecture. And this is something that was a theme in, in, in all our uh, talks uh, this afternoon. And um, one of the things that I think climate litigation is uh, being used to do by various litigants, and it's a network of very interesting and sort of very uh, uh, um, sort of well-resourced litigants around the world that are doing this, um, one of the uh, aims is to plug this ambition gap in the international governance architecture through litigation. So we have um, we have four cases in the European Court of Human Rights currently that are dealing with uh, that are sort of relevant to climate ambition. Um, um, James mentioned the Portuguese children's case, the youth activist case, but there are uh, three other cases as well that are pending before the European Court of Hum Human Rights on this. Uh, there are cases before the UN Human Rights Committee, uh, the Torres Strait Island, Islanders uh, case against Australia. There is, um, there are several cases in the, and pending in in Brazil, in Indonesia, in Korea, uh, in in Nepal. There are cases around the world that are essentially trying to address the question of ambition, how to increase or challenging their own government and the ambition that their governments uh, have in relation to climate change. And to me, it's a way of plugging the gaps in the international governance architecture, but the, because the Paris Agreement does not require states to take um, actions of a particular sort. It is not a prescriptive agreement. Uh, it does not tell states what they need to do to reach the temperature goal that it has identified. Um, so in, in response uh, to those gaps, um, national courts, regional courts, and increasingly international courts are being asked questions about, um, asked to deliberate on this. Um, there, is, uh, there is a tension with democratic uh, political decision-making processes, as, as you mentioned, but courts, ultimately are going to interpret the law, they're not going to make the law, but there is a lot of scope for creativity and imagination in interpretation of the law in the light of, uh, in the light of climate change and the sort of um, scientific evidence that we have on climate change. And that is what we're beginning to see from courts. Uh, they're not treading on de de democratic political 
uh, sort of domains or processes, but they are interpreting the law in a way that uh, requires states to do more. Um, and I think that's a very positive uh, direction that uh, legal imagination is taking going forward. Thank you. Th thank you, Lavanya. Can I move straight to, to Jones? Because you did bring up, again, some of these ca cases that are going through the courts, in including some brought by young people in, in different countries. How, how, how would, would you address my, my question about this relationship then between parliamentary, uh, uh, parliamentary institutions and uh, the court's judiciary? And actually, maybe, maybe, maybe you're pointed well about having young people in positions of executive power. Actually, what we need are 19-year-olds sitting as high court judges. <laughs> that's, a, that's a stretch, isn't it? I wouldn't say no. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah, it's a really interesting question, actually. Um, I think that young people and um, defendants in general, uh, or prosecutors in general, wouldn't be making these cases and bringing them forward as plaintiffs um, if it weren't our last port of call. It's an act of desperation to deal with the failings of governments um, of, the, of the last few decades. Um, and I think it's certainly true that we're going to have to see some step up in the increases amb in ambition that we have not seen to date. Uh, we have, of course, through the Paris Agreement, the ratchet mechanism, which kicks in every five years as a cycle to increase ambition. But as we know, policies now need to be set in place more like in a matter of months uh, in order to bring about the change we need to see in the next decade. And so if we rely on this system that we've had previously to increase ambition, I really don't have confidence that it's going to be done by itself through conventional parliamentary decision making. That having been said, um, I think there was a news story a couple of days ago I'm sure someone will know more about this than I do, um, that John Kerry and Alex Sharma seem quite optimistic about uh, new pledges to be brought forward and that momentum will somehow increase. I think they've got to say that, haven't they? Um, uh, but there, there does remain, I think, some hope, but I'm remaining cautiously optimistic. Okay, so maybe either Lee or Emma, do you have uh, any particular thoughts on, on, on this question about how you see the role of the courts, which has increased very dramatically, actually, since the Paris Agreement six years ago, with cases being brought and with judges at different levels within uh, national jurisdictions, actually taking decisions that are, in effect, overriding uh, par parliament parliamentary uh, uh, targets or, or policies. I think we need every tool in the box. So there's the legal system. We also need um, parliament and parliaments to enact laws. We also need uh, shareholders to raise these issues too. I think what we're dealing with fundamentally is an externality, externality that hasn't been paid for. So whether it's by introducing the pollute, making sure that the polluter really is paying. Most companies want to behave mm. responsibly. But if they know that the stick, either coming from the economic regulator, the financial regulator, or the eco um, environmental regulator, is strong enough, then they will hopefully keep within the law. And some organisations want to go beyond the law in a positive way. But from an environmental penalty perspective, I can think of one listed waste company that only this summer uh, received a, a, a penalty came from the courts, um, and it was less than his annual salary. That is not a disincentive to act in the right way to the environment. This was about sending waste overseas. Um, that we shouldn't be in waste anyway, but um, that, that's where we need to get a, re a rebalance. But it's not just the courts, it's not just parliament, it's everything. We need every tool in the box to be acting at pace to mean that we will stay within 1.5 degrees. But at the same time, what I think is absolutely essential is to recognize how challenging this is. And we need to get prepared rather than keeping lowering your emissions on one side of the equation and preparing for climate sh shocks as something that we do separately. We need to do both things together because this is massive and we're running out of time. So, Lee, do you think there is a democratic dilemma then? I mean, you study polarisation as part of your research activities, and, mm. and mm. as we've seen in, in, in many jurisdictions on many issues, our public seem to have become more polarised 
and we can think about some of the reasons why that might be. Mm -hmm. But do you actually see that this actually does lead us to, to questioning whether within democracies we actually any longer can use these democratic institutions and structures for making really tough decisions about questions that climate change poses at us? Or should, or, or should we, as some have, have absolutely argued, we, we, we move away from this idea of liberal democracies in the face of climate change? To a more authoritarian or, or, or centralized uh, yeah, indeed, type, and, type of regime. I mean, that's one of the things we know that an enhanced sense of threat prompts people to want stronger leaders. We know that's one of the dynamics that kicks off in people's psychology. Um, I'm very nervous about that. And I, I think that there would be a lot of resistance in a country like ours, a lot of civil resistance that could uh, you know, get, get very uh, ugly, I think. Uh, I think there's an in, in, intermediary actually um, of citizens' assemblies. Um, I think there have been a lot of them over the last few years that have actually come up with quite sensible solutions to quite challenging issues. And I think citizens' assemblies have a lot of structures to them that help people navigate debates in ways that get a lot more unhealthy when they happen online. So, you know, with a citizens' assembly, you have to bring together a representative sample of the population. Over a couple of weekends, you present them with expertise from uh, different people. You get to allow them to deliberate and debate. And they have to come to a consensus position around it. So a colleague of mine at UCL, Anna, Alan Renwick, ran one on Brexit. And, and that sort of assembly, I think, came up with a much more sensible compromise than our parliament had come up with. And, um, you know, you, there's, I think there's a lot of evidence that there's promise for those citizens' assemblies, which potentially give you some of the buy-in in, in the sense of, like, this is what a group of your peers have sort of deliberate, deliberated and decided amongst themselves, which might enable us to navigate some of these issues a little bit more quickly than we would through traditional parliamentary mechanisms. I just want to add on the courts as well. I think this issue of, you know, corporations getting away with things when I have to make these sacrifices to my behavior, I think this is going to, I think this also plays into the psychology of it. Why would I make these sacrifices to my behavior when some company is getting away with some horrendous, you know, pollution not being, uh, uh, you know, fined significantly for it? So I think those fines will help signal, you know, we're all in this together and all, you know, everyone's going to have to, you know, make sacrifices. Thank you. Um, now, uh, one last sort of issue perhaps I want to just bring up and then again get some responses from our panelists. I, I, I mean, I can't, I can't see your, your, your clock here, James, but I, but I know what it's on, what's on it. And, and what's really interesting to me is, is the way you have two messages on that clock. You have a threat mm. and you have an opportunity. Mm. Um, and I, I, this, is, this is what I just want you maybe to, 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 to explore in your different regimes here. I mean, again, Lee, you talked about, I think, gain frames and loss frames in the way in which climate change is communicated. And, and you know, mm. in many cases, the empirical evidence suggests actually the gain frames are, are, are much more empowering and they're more likely to, to bring people along. Um, and as, I don't know whether you know or not, I mean, I've written about the dangers of what I call deadlineism, of, of actually only showing the red mm. number. There are only seven more years or 10 or 20, whatever number of years there are. I just wonder, do you think, do you think deadlines such as those, what effects do you think they have either on general publics or upon politicians or decision makers? Do, do you think they have positive effects or, or do you see that there are some dangers in offering that type of a, a countdown clock to do? That's, that's a very good question and actually um, I knew when we started to um, build on this project that it would lead to some public criticism and there are many people I think in the environmental movement who do disagree with it um, and, and the way that it uses science to communicate um, both I guess the, the alarmism side of things as you mentioned uh, but also the renewable energy side of things as well, because it's partly because it's based on long-term averages as well. It's not necessarily providing instantaneous, up-to-date um, information. But yeah, in terms of the effects that that will have on society and on politicians, um, it's, it's controversial. I pressed ahead with this and, and believed that it would work because I saw the impact that the clock in New York had on the general public. I saw it make headlines all over the world um, I know from anecdotal evidence of even um, places in Kazakhstan, for example, that we have a, um, a group of young people over there who were working on a similar clock in their country. And they took a ride with a taxi driver 
Um, if you said, have you seen this clock in this in the city centre? It's, it's made me think, um, made me really concerned about climate change. It's opened my eyes to what's going on and I want to do something about it. Um, and I think that it's really, it's got to the stage now where we are in such desperate need of action um, that it would concern me more that people didn't know the timescales that we were facing, because I think so many people don't, um, than the possibility that they might react um, in an adverse way to them. Uh, if we had more time, I would be, I'd be more careful. Okay, I, I have certainly looking forward to seeing this projected on seven, seven stories in, in, in Glasgow. Uh, Emma, can I sort of raise the same question with you? I mean, I, I, think, I think you even may have used the phrase in your presentation today about, you know, we either die or adapt to the headlines that followed the EA report this week. You know, you, you, you know, this is the stark choice that we face. Is that form of communication where you're presenting these absolutely stark alternatives, do you think effective? In, in, in doing what? In, in, in gaining attention, but actually moving people forward in their thinking. It's a really, really fine balancing act, but we need to wake up to how serious it is. And then we need to make sure that we are acting in a way that gives hope. And when I'm in my darkest moments, it is through action, through actually doing something, no matter how small it might be, that I start to feel actually we can do this and every one of those actions um, that we build and share and um, make sure that we are showing what a difference it all adds up to doing is where you get get hope but I think we would be failing in our duties not to tell it as it is because it is really stark and I have been out and I know um, Chris has been out in literally in our Wellingtons meeting with communities in this country, often vulnerable communities, um, poor communities who are living with that vulnerability of a changing climate. It is real and uh, I, have, I have to tell the truth, but equally I have to make sure that we are offering hope that that moment is getting ever smaller. So the gain and the loss rate then, Lee, you mentioned this as well, that gain frames, you know, this, this, this idea of just doing something positive. Can you elaborate on, on, should we only then be using gain frames when talking about the opportunities that climate change presents, or are loss frames essential as well? I think it's essential to be honest and I think, again, I mean, maybe there's some parallels with COVID here. Uh, you know, I think some of the communication around the start was around, you know, avoiding the sense of panic around it. But actually, you know, I, I think people were able to accommodate to the reality. And, I, and the clock reminds me of, um, I've got this awful habit now of checking the, the daily numbers on The Guardian, you know, I can't stop checking. And I kind of feel like, just as I know, you know, roughly how many cases there are each day, I think it'd be great if we kind of had a sense of how long we've got to, to uh, you know, reduce our carbon uh, uh, emissions. So I think, the, I think it has to be that dual-sided approach of um, communicating the reality of the situation, but also giving people a sense of positive hope. And exactly, I agree with this, you know, giving people small things that they can do in their lives to help build towards a sense that this is a solvable problem, you know, the, the planting mm -hmm. of the trees. The other point I wanted to make about the loss frame though, which is that it's also about how you, you know, try and persuade people about things. As I was saying, with coming sort of cunning rephrasing of Brexit, actually allowing us to go back to, you know, British life rather than sort of losing something in, in uh, taking on Brexit. You know, there's, there's ways of thinking about these things when you talk about reducing the dominance of cars in urban environments. You could frame this as trying to get back to a world where our kids could play on the streets and where there'd be more of a sense of community on our streets. Uh, and so I think there's, you know, this, the goal is the same, but actually the framing puts it in terms of us, you know, getting back to something we've lost, which I think could actually be more persuasive for some people. Good, thank you. And uh, Lavanya, um, can, can I sort of raise the same issue with you from your perspective? Uh, I mean, you can interpret this how you, how, you, how you wish, either focusing on maybe on the COP, or, or I know, you know, your, your deep understanding of Indian climate politics. Uh, maybe actually that would be an interesting perspective for you to, to bring here is is climate change within Indian climate discourse, public discourse. Is climate change seen as a threat or an opportunity 
is it a is it an opportunity to gain or is it a is it a, a threat that that un undermines you know Indian public confidence in the future? Well, I think uh, there are two different questions there, one on the clock and the uh, sort of utility of deadlines, as it were, which I'd like to say a word about, and also on Indian climate politics. Uh, I think on India, so it's seen both as a threat and as an opportunity. Uh, it depends on who you ask, which constituencies and stakeholders you're talking to. Um, but from the government perspective, I think it was seen... It, even the negotiations to some extent were seen as, uh, as challenging because they were going to impinge on our sovereign uh, sort of choices with respect to development pathways. But over time that has also, uh, also sort of changed uh, into a more proactive uh, position and on climate change and taking climate action. Um, but, uh, and, and business and industry has always been very entrepreneurial uh, as far as climate change is concerned. Uh, it is India that pioneered the idea of unilateral clean development mechanisms, and it was Indian industry and business that did that. Um, so I think it's seen both as threat and as an opportunity uh, in India, uh, and it has certainly gained in public prominence over time. And it, it is very much seen, at least among researchers, as an all of government, all of society, uh, sort of challenge which uh, which we now face, and it's been ma mainstreamed into our conversation. So there's certainly been lots of positive developments on that front. Uh, on the deadline question, I think if I could just speak to that briefly with respect to um, placing expectations. Coming back to the theme of this entire panel discussion, placing expectations on particular conferences of parties, and and you know. Uh, framing those as a deadline. If we don't do this by X date, then um, you know, um, uh, then you know, all hell will break loose. And I think we need, to, while it's important to underscore the importance of uh, the temporal dimension in this, and the fact that we have very little, uh, little time left to uh, put ourselves on a sort of pathway uh, to 1.5 degrees centigrade. I'm cautious about placing those kinds of expectations on conferences of parties because you are negotiating process is a creature of somewhat dysfunctional politics uh, and negotiating dynamics. And uh, if, if we place those kinds of expectations on the UN negotiating process, um, what if, if it does not deliver? You know, we still need, uh, we still need to do what we need to do to get to 1.5 degrees or well below two degrees centigrade, uh, whether COP26 delivers or not. Uh, we might need to do more by COP27. We might need to do it differently by COP27, but we will still need to be doing what we need to be doing. So I think we need to be somewhat cautious about placing too many expectations on particular conferences of parties or particular moments in time and look at this as, um, as something that needs to be done uh, uh, immediately and soon and with a sense of uh, gravity of the consequences of what we're dealing with, uh, but not to place too many expectations. Um, I think having been on the inside of the climate change negotiating process, I'm just a little nervous about placing too many expectations on the UN negotiating process. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and maybe actually that last point brings, brings you back to something you said as well about, about the COP, that, that on the, uh, it's both an event and a process, uh, that you know, the process is very much uh, uh, constrained by the inter intergovernmental uh, United Nations negotiations, but the event itself is an opportunity to build and to accelerate momentum. Uh, and this idea of actually momentum, the direction of travel and, and the speed at which one is going down that particular path is perhaps more important than whether a particular number is secured by a particular date. Uh, thank you, of course, to our panelists, uh, James, Emma, Lee, and Lavanya, uh, particularly for joining and bearing with us. And I also just one or two other words of thanks at the end here that actually has made this whole event possible too. And that is the Corporate Partnership Programme at Pembroke College, and in particular, Matthew and Kate and Slilia uh, for organising the event and making it actually work uh, as a hybrid event for the first time, which is which is uh, very, very successful. Also for the master and for my fellows, my fellow fellows, can I say that? <laughs> At Pembroke College, Amanda, Mark, Mike, and Simon, um, who helped to scope uh, and shape the discussion topic and also to identify uh, speakers, the corporate partners who also joined in that roundtable discussion in uh, setting up this uh, William Pitt seminar. Um, and just finally to say that there will be a short written summary of the event uh, uh, published uh, through 
uh, the, our Pembroke website, including a recording of the seminar up until the public part of it. Um, and of course, you can continue to follow the Pembroke uh, Corporate Partnership Programme through our Twitter and LinkedIn uh, connections. So I think at this point, I will hand over to Lord Smith to bring proceedings to a close. Well, thank you very much uh, indeed, Mike. And uh, I, I have to say the very last word that could be used to describe the conversation uh, that we've just had is dull. <laughs> Uh, it's been an absolutely fascinating um, uh, discussion and as well as reiterating your thanks to all of our speakers and uh, particularly perhaps to uh, Lavanya who's uh, uh, joined us uh, remotely. Uh, uh, can I also thank you for some brilliant chairing of the event. Thank you very much. Thank you of course to Selwyn. Uh, for hosting us here uh, in uh, this rather lovely auditorium. Uh, 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 there's one other thank you I'd uh, like to make. Um, uh, uh, when you are part of the, when you become part of the Pembroke community, uh, you are part of our community for life. And one of our previous uh, uh, corporate partner, William Pitt Fellows, uh, was actually rather instrumental in inspiring the topic and uh, helping us to uh, put uh, uh, all of this uh, together. Uh, sadly, he wasn't able to be here in the room with us, but he is online, uh, and that is uh, uh, Peter Matthews. Peter, thank you very much indeed.